Hello, uh, in today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how to use the software program called Simca to perform principal component analysis on spectroscopic data. Today's tutorial, I'm going to use some example data which I found online, and I will make the link to that available in the description below. What we're going to do is load that data in and do some processing, give some examples of some of the options available to you in Simca, and then hopefully inspire you to uh, experiment with your own data. So when you first open Simca, you will be greeted to a screen that looks a bit like this. There's not very much on it. It's not had a project opened in it before, or if it has, the project has been closed. However, if you reopen Simca, uh, any project you're working on before will reopen uh, with that. So you should expect to come across this grayed out uh, options and blank. So what you need to do is import your data. So there's two options. On the right hand side is the analysis advisor, which offers uh, a wizard on how to do that. Or you can go to file, new, regular project. And then this opens up a slightly different window, which offers us up a file browser where we can find the data we wish to import. So we're using mid infrared data or the fresh meets data set. This data is originally provided in a CSV format. I've done a little bit of work to clean it up and make it more amenable for our analysis. And so we're going to open this Excel spreadsheet instead. However, there's a whole world of different file formats which Simca can open. Personally, I recommend having all of your data tabulated as you wish before you go to Simca, just so that if you have to reopen it or create a new model, you don't have to do too much work every single time in Simca. So we select this one and press OK. Now, because it was a workbook, we can have multiple worksheets. I know that we want to use sheet one. The first one was the raw data. Sheet one is my reformatted stuff and we don't need sheet two. So we press OK. And then this loads our data in for us. Now, this looks like a spreadsheet, just as you'd imagine. We have got our first column, which consists of the primary observation IDs. These are quite long and descriptive. So what I've done is I've formed a much short version of these. So instead of saying fresh chicken, it says C. Instead of saying supplier A, it says A. Instead of saying sample one, it's just sample one. And then run A is just A. And this means that we can down to four letter code as opposed to having this much longer name. So we need to now tell it that this is our primary ID. This grays out this column, which is no longer going to be included in our model. This is equivalent to selecting here and saying exclude column. Now, if we look down at the bottom, there's still there's some problems. We have a non-unique primary observation ID and we don't have a primary variable ID. So our variables in infrared uh, spectroscopy are our wave numbers. So we set that first row to be primary IDs and they all go green. These are the wave numbers. You can see they increase from about 1005 uh, all the way along to about 1800 wave numbers. This is all starting to look quite good. We have a few other columns here. These have been automatically determined to either be variables, in which case it's numeric, or if it's a letter, they'll suggest it's perhaps a qualitative, uh, a qualitative data column. We don't want it to be that. We want to label these secondary IDs. So our primary ID is the unique identifier for that sample, and secondary IDs do not have to be unique. They are just a further description. So in this case, the secondary IDs are what type of meat it was, what type of supplier it was from, what type of sample, what number of sample it was, and which run it was, whether it was A or B in terms of replicates. So once those are all labeled, they become a pale yellow. Our primary ID is a dark yellow and our primary variables are green. Now the data needs to be this way around where your observations are row labels and your variables are column headers. If they're not this way around, you can go to edit at the top, select transpose, and your data will rotate. Now we still have one problem, which is that our primary observation IDs are not unique. If we press the go to button, it finds for us where this error was. We can see that we had two labeled PD1B. Must just be a simple mistake. So we've now corrected that. And now that is A, that is B, no problems. Once we're happy that our data is laid out correctly, we can press finish. At this point, it asks us where we want to save our Simca project. So this will be a .usp file. These are slightly larger than the raw data. You may want to give it a more descriptive name, but for today, we'll just leave it as that. Press save. And now this launches us back into Simca, which we saw at the beginning of the video. 
few of these options have now got uh, are now clickable and are lit up. We also have a bit more detail in here. So I'll just go through a little bit of what we see. We have a ribbon interface at the top, just like you get in Microsoft Office. We've got file, home, data, analyze, predict, and clicking on any of these opens up a new set of options. Underneath home, we have a few of the most important ones we're going to use. Beneath that, we have our project window, which tells us what number model that we have got and what model number that is. So this is number one, which is also known as M1. You can create multiple models and I highly recommend that you do. And then there's a type associated with that. So we're interested in doing PCA. So this type is set to PCA by default. This is because we did not give it any class identifiers. If we had, this may come out as PCA class or as a PLS or OPLS type model. If the wrong model is selected, you just go up here click on change model type and select PCA X. If you wanted to do other types of models, they are available, but that's not what we were looking for today. You can see that it says it's unfitted, and this is because the model has yet not been calculated. So what we can do is select it, go up and press auto fit. This very quickly calculates for us the optimal number of principal components. We could manually have clicked on two first and calculated just principal components one and two, and we can add and remove them as we see fit. However, generally speaking, auto fit, it does a sufficiently good job. If we go down to this uh, line again, we can see that there are for A, six, which means there are six components have been calculated. N is 120, which indicates the number of observations, samples or spectra, which there were in this case. So 120 different spectra were made, uh, recorded. We have an R squared cumulative value, which is 0.994, which is very high, and a Q squared cumulative value of 0.9, which is also very high. Date associated when we created the model. Title, which by default is untitled. And I highly recommend that you give each model a descriptive title so that when you can flick through them relatively quickly and know what differences you've made, whether you've left out samples or whether you've changed processing options. So the default plot that comes out is a summary of fit. You can see that it has M1 written under it, which relates it to model number one. And you can see that it describes both the R squared and Q squared values cumulatively for all of the components. If we add a component, you can see another bar is added. And if we remove it, it goes back to six. If at any point you add and remove too many, you can press auto fit and it brings you back to the optimal number of components. Now this plot is not very useful in itself and it takes up a lot of space. So for a lab report, I would recommend you just tabulate these numbers uh, rather than bothering to include this as a figure. If you're ever not sure of what a figure is showing you, the analysis advisor on the top right can actually give you some more information. It doesn't have an exhaustive amount of information, but it can certainly point you in the right direction. So it tells you a little bit about what R squared and Q squared are when you are on the summary of fit. We'll close this for now because we don't want to save that plot. What we do want to do, however, is start to look at our scores plots. So PCA is quite commonly used just to produce scores plots, which tell us a little bit about how our samples are different or the same. So if we press on this button here, we will get a 2D scores plot. And if we press this drop down arrow, we get a few different options. But just for today, we'll click on this and we get a scatter plot of X versus Y. In this case, the scores represented by the symbol T for principal component one versus the scores for principal component two, which is on the Y axis. Now, we have got four letter codes for every single sample. So you can see there are 120 different points on this plot. And these labels can be quite uh, confusing and overlap on top of each other. So it's quite a good idea usually to get rid of them, especially when you have a lot of points. So if we go up to the top underneath plot, which is available, there should be tools. And underneath there, there's labels, which we can set to no label. And that clears up the plot for us just a little bit. You'll notice also that everything is green because as far as the model is concerned, it doesn't know anything about the samples. So this is based purely on the spectroscopic information which you've uh, provided with to it. This ellipse represents the Hurtling T2, which is a multivariate uh, version of a student's t-test. And essentially anything out with this ellipse is described as an outlier, as in it is outside the 95% confidence of the model. There's only three points which are outside of that. And if we mouse over any given point, we can see both its X and Y coordinates, primary ID, and then any other secondary IDs associated with it. Now the 
sample down here is uh, meat T, which is turkey, supplier E, sample 7, run B, and the nearby point is also a turkey, also from the same supplier. Uh, it's a different sample, however, but it stands to reason that they're fairly similar because they're both turkeys from the same supplier. Now, it's obviously not convenient to mouse over every single point, so what can be more useful is if we colour our points by anything we do know about the samples. So this is not a blind study. We know that some of these are chicken, some of them are pork, some of them are turkey. So if we go up to the top where it says color by, we can select observation IDs or the secondary IDs which we loaded to describe the options. So if we select meat, first of all, you can see that we now have three discrete clusters of points. There is a little bit of overlap between them, uh, but largely speaking, all of the green circles which correspond to chickens are on the right hand side all of the pork ones are on the top left and all of the turkey are in the bottom left now how we can interpret this as well is by just looking at the zero intersections across x and y we can say that on the right hand side of principal component one are all of the chicken samples and on the left hand side are almost all of the others so principal component one is separating out chicken from the others with a little bit of exception, but in this case, all of the chickens are on the right hand side. Likewise, principal component two is separating out all of the pork from all of the turkey with a little bit of uh, overlap, but not too much. So this tells us that this principal component analysis has worked reasonably well. We have some clustering of types of samples and we have a little bit of uh, noise indicating that maybe these things are not perfectly separated but that's to be expected as this is an unsupervised method and not a classification technique that getting these results is actually quite good now we can also look at some of the other variables in this case we have supplier now by default it might not pick for you the best color scheme so in this case both a and c have been given the same glyphs so what we can do is click on c and that selects all of the points associated with that right click on that and then we can change the color to maybe something like purple and then click somewhere else and you can see that now we've got our purple so we already knew that all of these points were roughly segregated into the type of meat and then within each of those clusters we can see that now well maybe supplier c is separated slightly from supplier a within the two type within the ch the uh, pork i believe was over here initially Turkey is, seems to be supplied exclusively by supplier E, so there's not much information in there. But this doesn't necessarily mean too much. It just suggests that P, principal component one and two aren't the best for separating these things out. We don't always have to look at just principal component one and two. Again, if we go to plot tools, we can change which components are on which axes. So we could switch one and two. Usual convention is the principal component one is always shown and is always on the X axis, but feel free to experiment. Component two is on the Y axis, but if we select here, we can change it to component three. And now you can see that there is a slight change in what we're observing. Doesn't hugely tell us more about the suppliers. So we can look at component four and we can look at component five and we can look at component six. And largely speaking, there's not a huge amount to see here. So clearly we're not able to discriminate suppliers just from this model as it is. So we return it to component two and we can flick through to see the sample numbers, but there was quite a lot of samples, or we can flick through and look at run. So these spectra were required in duplicate A and B. If there was a systematic error between A and B, you would expect all of the A's to cluster in one way and all of the B's to cluster. However, they do not, which suggests quite reassuringly that the replicates were reasonably good. However, if the replicates were perfect, you would expect A and B to be on top of each other. If we try over here, we can see that this corresponds to e, TE4B and this one corresponds to TE2A. So that suggests that the two turkeys are pretty similar, but these are different samples. So the replicates are not actually more reproducible necessarily than the different samples. So again, that gives us a piece of information about the quality of the data that was acquired. We might, however, want to go back to looking at the meat options. And you want to say, OK, how can we tell these things apart? So if we go up to the home tab again, this time, instead of plotting the scores, we can plot the loadings. So you can click on here and produce a scatter plot that will do the loadings 
for one versus two, but we're more interested because we had spectroscopic data that was continuous data, we can select line. And this will give us a line plot for the first component against the input variables, which gives us something that looks a little bit like this. Now, P is the shorthand for loadings, just like T was the shorthand for scores. And again, component one. Now, this looks a little bit like an infrared spectrum. You'll notice, however, that the numbers at the bottom do not reflect what we're expecting. So we can clean this up if we select this, this row, right click properties, and then this window which appears, we can go to label types and axis label, we can change that to variable ID, press apply, and now we have wave numbers going from 1000 through to 2000. If you prefer, it is possible to uh, change the length of this, so maybe we don't actually need that good enough if they're all just four characters. So that gets rid of our decimal places. We may also wish to change what is written here, in which case we just double click and we can change the title. And in the case of some data, we might actually want the largest number to be on the left and the smallest number to be on the right, such as in the case of uh, NMR data, in which case you might click reverse axis, press apply, and that flips things around. We can do the same for the y axis. We can also change the scaling and the title, and these things are all fair enough for you to experiment with, especially with regards to producing nice publication quality plots. In terms of formatting the plot, there are a few other options. So we can also get to that menu by right clicking anywhere in the plot and selecting Format Plot. And we can see we've got axes options, grid lines that we can enable and disable, a background. Titles can be put there. We can have a timestamp so that you know the version of Simca and the date and time which this plot was produced. Subheaders, footers, which can include information about the R squared values, for example, and the header, which might be the title. Generally speaking, I like to keep the plots nice and clean and I don't include any of these unless it's just for reference, but I wouldn't include them for a paper. The legend can be useful. In this case, the legend is not necessary. So we can click that till it's no longer selected, press apply and it disappears. And if we wish to change any of the colors, we can change it so that it's, for example, a dashed line, which is perhaps not useful, or we could change the color of it, maybe to something like a nice blue, however you wish to uh, experiment with this. So with this loadings plot, we can see the contributions of each variable to our principal components. So we can see that it's fairly flat along the top, which is what we may call like a, a global mode. There's a massive dip at around about 1736, and then it tails off towards the end. Now, I did not acquire this data, so I don't know what it looks like. However, we do have access to the data as that is what we've been processing. We can see it numerically by going up here at the top left and clicking on the data set, and it shows us again our spreadsheet as it was before. Or instead, we can go to the top and we can go to data, we can go to spectra, and we can click on this and plot our spectra. And you can see here that this is what our spectra looked like for all 120 samples. Now, this is why we're doing PCA on this data set, because these infrared spectra all look essentially the same across all of the samples. There's subtle differences in intensities, but they have, largely speaking, the same peaks. This suggests that by hand, I wouldn't be able to tell which one was chicken, which one was pork, which one was turkey. But from our scores plot, we can tell which ones are which, which is good for us. But then we want to relate this back to the spectra. And to do that, we use the loadings plot. So we can see here that there is a slight dip at maybe 1161. And if we look at our observation spectra, we can see that that's uh, round about here. This is not necessarily a huge feature, but perhaps if we knew more about the uh, typical infrared regions of functionalities and uh, sorts of chemistries, we could relate this to what was in there. If we knew more about the samples, that might be useful. So, if, for example, we weren't using an, uh, infrared, but using something like NMR or mass spectrometry, we might be able to get some very interesting chemical information and insight into what's different between the samples as seen in the scores plot based on what's happening in the loadings plot. Now, this loadings plot initially only shows us principal component one, which means it's only telling us about why things are on the right or on the left and nothing to do with their vertical position.
So to instead to interrogate that, we click on our loadings plot, go to plot tools and change component one to component two. And you can see this gives us a little bit more information. It suggests that there's a feature again around about 11.48, 11.27, something over at 10.30. And these are telling us why some things are, are high on our y-axis and some things are low on our y-axis. If you ever wish to take this data out of Simca, for example, to plot it in another program, if you click on list, it gives you the X and Y coordinates for whatever is in your plot. This works for scores plots too, to give us this, and it includes our labels to help you color code it, however you decide to, and it gives you X and Y values. However, generally speaking, you can make acceptable publication quality plots in Simca, provided you take care with a few steps. So this can include, when you go to uh, save as, right click save as, it asks you what size you want to produce. So it offers up standard sizes for presentations or for documentation. So you might say, okay, I want it to be square. Print quality is gonna be 300 DPI. It tells you that that's good. If you're making it just for the screen, 96. And we press okay, uh, Simca demo. And then we'll say, let's save this as a PNG called score scatter plot M1. Maybe give it a more useful name when you're doing it yourself. And then if we look in our file explorer, we can see we've got that now saved. If we open this, we get this plot. Now this is a square aspect ratio for the entire plot. However, that means that the actual inset of our scatter plot is no longer square. So you may wish to manually tweak the settings to optimize this. So you may decide actually, when we go file, save as, change it so that it's actually about 900 pixels wide and 600 pixels tall, press okay. Let's save over that, press yes. And then if we go back to here, open it up, you can see that gives us a slightly nicer looking plot. It's a good idea to know the size of the figure you're trying to make before you start making all your figures. Cause obviously if we then stick this in a document at a very small size, it might be the case that these numbers aren't readable or these labels aren't good enough. The default settings are not necessarily very good in Simca, so you may have to experiment with this to make it work exactly as you wish. You may also decide that there are too many numbers along here or needs to change what the axis labels are. And as I showed you before, you could do that by going to the format plot options and changing titles and changing axes. So we go to axis, X axis, so we can change the title that's there. And we can perhaps make it so that this is actually only showing us every 20 increments, which cleans up the plot slightly, makes it slightly nicer. Nobody's ever going to be reading off exact numbers on this. So you don't need a high resolution of X axis and Y axis labels, to be honest. So we can increase that to maybe 10. Press OK. Now, if we save this plot, save it over again, press yes. This gives us something that looks like this, which again is slightly cleaner than we had before. So that is the basic process by which we can use Simca to generate a principal component model, look at our scores plot to see which samples are similar, which samples are different, see if there's any outliers, perhaps we need to exclude those data from the model. We can look at the loadings plot to try and relate why our, why our differences and similarities are related to our observation spectra. This will all become more intuitive when you do it for yourself. Now, there's plenty more that you can do in Simca. Uh, we're about 20 minutes in so far into what you can do. If you right click on this model, we can go to new as model one. You can also edit it, but generally speaking, I would suggest you make new models. And this gives you this work set option. If it doesn't, it's probably given you this simple mode, which looks a little bit like this. However, I recommend you use the advanced mode because it gives you a bit more freedom and makes it a bit clearer what's going on. So the overview gives you your variables and you can see there's 448 and your observations of which there's 120. We have not labeled any classes and we've not done any transformations, expansions, lags, and all the scaling is UV. So if we want to tweak any of these settings, we can go to variables, and we go, we can say, well, maybe we don't want to include that many of our variables, in which case we hit exclude. And you can see that now we're only got 371, we've excluded 77. If we click back on X, they again become X variables. We don't have any Y variables in this data. We don't need to worry about that for today. 
Likewise, we can go to our observations and we can say, oh, actually, let's exclude all of the chicken samples. So that's all of the C samples. And we click exclude, and that brings us down to 80. If we click include, we've got them back. Instead, we could also label classes. For example, we could set that as class one. This would allow us to do classification modeling. However, that's not what we're going to be doing today. We can perform transformations. Now, these are mathematical operations on our data. So we can see, for example, the skewness, minimum, max, minimum that we're interested in. We may decide, oh, actually, this data should be transformed. So we can select it all and pick perhaps a log transformation, set our parameters in here, click set, and then that gives us what our new numbers will be. So you can see our minimum maximum ratio is changed for what it was before. In fact, let's set that back to none and it returns the data to how they were. Lag is more to do with time series data. Expand, again, not really necessary. Scaling, however, can be very important. So this is a pre-processing step performed between the raw data and the PCA. By default, Simca uses UV, which stands for unit variance, which is also known as auto scaling. This gives everything a standard deviation of one, I believe. Uh, double check that and look up the other options which are available. So if you select all, under set scaling, there's type, and under type, you could set it to none and press set and you see that disappears. Or you could set it to PAR, which stands for Pareto, which is another type of scaling. Or you could set it to centering without scaling, etc., etc. So let's change it to Pareto scaling. And then that gives us our spreadsheet at the end, but we don't need to look at that. So now our overview gives us this. We can set missing value tolerances. However, this data set does not have any missing values. And we can change the model type here if we wished. However, it will only let you change it to ones which you can perform. If we're happy with this, the only change that we have made is set the scaling to Pareto instead of unit variance. We press OK, and now we get a second model, M2, unfitted. You'll notice it's got the same number of observations, same date, also not got a title. And we press auto fit, and we see we've got a slightly different model. So this has got four components instead of six. And the R squared and Q squared values are ever so slightly different. Uh, however, the significance of this difference is essentially negligible. Now, at this point, it's a good idea to rename. So let's call this Pareto, and let's rename the top one to be UV, it's in unit variance. And now, if we plot, plot the scores plot for model number two, you can see that we have got a slightly different model to what we had with model one. Now, if this doesn't seem hugely obvious straight away, you can flick between the two of them, Unfortunately, this is not the right color, so we can change that to be in green. However, that didn't change it. So now we've got green, gray, and blue. Green, gray, and blue. And you could see a few differences. One, the numbers are different. So this was on an order of plus or minus 40 and plus or minus 20. And now we're looking at plus or minus 8, plus or minus 2 or 3. So the numbers have changed. Doesn't mean a huge amount. We still have the same two outliers, TE3 and TE7. And we still have our separation in these two regions. You'll notice before. Well, no, actually, they're, they're pretty similar. So Pareto scaling has not made a substantial difference in this in this instance. That's not to say it won't necessarily have benefited it in maybe a higher component, looking at different uh, types of samples, looking at the supplier or sample as opposed to looking at just the meat. So there's quite a lot of combinations of things that you can start to experiment with. And that's before we consider excluding regions of the spectra. So we might, for example, decide maybe there's a bit of noise in here, we want to exclude that, or maybe this is just noise, this entire region, and it's not interesting. So we could build model with fewer variables or fewer observations. Finally, um, there's a few other things we can experiment with in here. We can do some prediction. Some of this is more important when you're looking at classification analysis. We can get different types of plots up here. Again, a lot of this depends on what type of experiments and data you're looking at. Developer options allow you to do some scripting in Python if you would prefer to work that way. And if you want, you can go back to analyze. In the case of PCA, you can see the contribution, which tells you the scores related to the uh, T2. There's quite a lot of options in here. 
by plot, we'll plot a scatter plot with both loadings and our scores on the same plot. Unfortunately, in quite high density data like we have here, the by plot ends up looking a little bit confusing, not immediately obvious. What it kind of suggests is that chicken has got a lot of everything and the pork and turkey have got whatever fewer over here in terms of stronger features for those samples and stronger features for the other samples. Generally speaking, this sort of analysis with biplots doesn't work plotting every variable that you have. Key ones are more important, or if you have far fewer variables. If we go back to data, it's also possible to do some other uh, transformations in here. If you have time series, you can do time series filters, but in the case of spectral data, which is what we have, we can also perform some spectral filters. Now these include a number of options, some of which are mathematically fairly straightforward to understand, such as derivatives, which we can append, or we can include the savitsky gole filter, which is a type of uh, denoising, smoothing filter. So we'll, we can put two of them in, and we can put them in in different orders so that they run consecutively. So what we will do is we'll apply the derivatives to this data. So our data had a lot of smooth features. So perhaps derivatives will accentuate any subtle features and their subtle differences. So press OK. This asks us, do we want to include all of the variables and all of the observations, which yes, we do. And then it gives us a preview of what the derivative will look like for each spectrum. And we can flick through and see that, well, we know all the spectra kind of look the same. We can also decide if we're doing a first, second or third order derivative. So we can do second and third, and obviously third gives us far greater noise than the first. But we can use a quadratic or a cubic polynomial to do the calculation. And how many points are used in each one is also an option. So we can increase that to 30, for example. Maybe not 30, has to be an odd number. Uh, so it could be 31, or we can reduce that down to seven. And that gives us quite a bit more noise. So we'll say, leave it at 15 and one, press next. Then it gives us a new data set name, mid infrared fresh meats underscore first derivative, finish. So now we have our data here. There are missing points at the beginning and there will be missing points at the end. And this is because we used uh, blocks of however many points to calculate the derivatives. So it's nothing to worry about here. Now, if we go back to our home, we can click up here, new, and we can create a new model. And this time we have an extra tab on our work set options, which asks us which data set we want to use. So we're gonna use the first derivative data set. We're gonna use the default unit variance and the default of all the other settings. And we're gonna press okay. This gives us model number three, again, PCA, click auto fit. And this gives us something which has far more components. So this is now 11 components. R squared is significantly less than it was for the other two options. Q squared is also significantly less. And let's have a look at what the scores options looks like. Well, this gives us actually much better separation of chicken, pork, and turkey. So even though the R squared and Q squared values are lower, our scores plot superficially seems to be much better at separating out pork from turkey and chicken. And if you don't believe me, we can go back and look at the first one and you can see that they are all much more loose within each group and closely together. Whereas here, they are much tighter compact. Now, again, not perfect, but there's still some interesting information in here. And again, we can look at the loadings. However, this is now the loadings of the first derivative data. So we need to be careful how we interpret this going backwards. And again, we can look at perhaps the other options in terms of suppliers, samples, and runs. But again, I wouldn't expect any of those to give us a huge amount of information. With that, that essentially concludes the obvious options which are available to you in Simca. I recommend that you give your uh, models titles. So we can call this first der UV. Make sure that that's correct there. And we can click save up here. And this essentially is the sort of work that you would be expected to do using Simca for PCA. Now, there's lots of other options in here. And if you're ever not sure what to do, there is help online, there is a knowledge base, which provides a lot of information. And that is what we have to show you today. So I hope this has made some sense. Um, if not, the best thing you can do is really just load up some data, press all the buttons and do some reading and see what starts to make sense. 
When it comes to a report, I recommend that you don't just include every single thing that you've done. Perhaps it makes more sense to make several different models and then in your report you can discuss what you've done, but you maybe only include figures related to the best models that you've managed to produce. And as you can see, you can produce multiple models and you don't need to delete each one. So unless you do something which is terrible and you don't want to include it, I would always suggest creating new models. And um, with that, good luck.